Thank you for listening to this episode. Make sure you come back for the next episode covering the points of this conversation. And follow the podcast on social media by finding at Prestigious Pod. Follow me, Mr. Kent, at Mr. Chris R. Kent. Follow me, Chris Bean, at Chris Bean Official. Join our Discord for exclusive content and personal interactions. And if you'd like to be coached on how to live a more prestigious life, you can reach out to me, Chris Bean, on one of my social media platforms or by emailing the podcast directly at prestigiousinitiative at gmail.com. Lastly, sign up for our newsletter either through social media or on our website. This is the Prestigious Initiative. Welcome. I'm Chris Bean, and here with me is Chris Kent. Hello, Mr. Kent. Hello, sir. Today, we have a fantastic guest who's joining us to share insights on creating unshakable habits for success. Joining us is Stephen Box, a national board-certified health and wellness coach with over a decade of experience in helping people achieve deep health. Welcome, Stephen. How are you today? Doing good. Thanks for having me, guys. So I'm wondering, can you share a little bit of, of insight into who you are, just so our listeners have a better understanding of where you're coming from? Yeah, so I guess the best thing to do would be kind of share where I was about 12 years ago. I, I was working as a retail store manager, and one day I went into my store and I was viewing the security footage from the weekend before, and because I had been off that weekend, and I saw this guy behind our counter on the camera that I didn't recognize. Well, long story short, I ended up realizing it was me as I'm speed dialing my assistant manager to cuss him out for allowing some stranger behind our counter. And so that moment was kind of the, the final breaking point for me that, hey, man, I need to do something, right? I'm, I'm massively overweight and I don't feel the way I want to feel. I'm not the athlete I was growing up. This isn't who I want to be. And so I started this journey of losing 80 pounds. And over the course of that process, there were a few things that were different from every other weight loss attempt I had before. Number one, I decided I wanted to be the stubborn one to prove the world wrong that you had to eat nothing but steamed grilled chicken breast and broccoli, right? That you could eat whatever you wanted and still lose weight. And I accomplished that. I also wanted to prove that you didn't have to do endless hours of cardio because I did. And honestly, to this day, still do hate cardio. So to me, that's really where my journey begins, right? And it kind of developed this passion for health and fitness. And I didn't really like my job at the time. So once I had lost the weight, it was an easy transition to say, I want to do this. I went on to become a personal trainer, later added nutrition but still found people weren't really getting the results. And then I started studying things like behavior change and I really dived into like sleep and stress management. But I still realized that there were other factors like time management and prioritization, things like that, that were really holding people back. And that's when I said, you know what? It's great to help people with just their physical health. But if I can help people in all these different areas, right? If I can really help them to focus on creating the habits the other stuff kind of falls in line, right? So it's really about helping people with those habits, whether it's their health, their relationships, their career, whatever areas they want to work on their habits in. If I can help them do that, I can help them accomplish anything. Well, and, and you know, in your, in your studies and in, in your time coaching people, um, uh, does habits seem to be let's see, uh, part of like an underlying operating system to how that person operates throughout, uh, throughout the day? Yeah, so I think one of the things that people maybe don't realize is the exact same things that helped me lose 80 pounds are the same things that helped me to start my own business and start my own podcast. And they're the same things that helped me have a successful marriage. The skills for each of those things differ. But the underlying habits, the consistency factor, my ability to show up and perform at a high level. And FYI, when I say high level, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're performing 10 out of 10 every day. If, if your day, if that day you only have a 3 out of 10 on the energy scale and you give it a 3 out of 10, that, that's, that's, that's 100%, right? So when I say show up at a high level, that means whatever you have to give that day. Those are your habits. Your habits are what allows you to actually show up and do that. All right. In my, in my experience, 
habits to me imply a certain sort of magic. And by magic, I mean people say, hey, just make a habit for that. And then you're, you'll, you'll forget it. You'll, you'll do it and you don't have to think so much about it. And in that, my terminology for habits, I've, I've adjust, adjusted. So I don't say habits. I don't think about habits as habits anymore. I instead think about them as daily practices or weekly practices or whatever it is. Because in, in my eyes, habit implies that there is some sort of magic to it. It happens without, like on autopilot, but very little happens on autopilot without actually thinking about it. So what I've done again is, is shift that term habit to practice because I understand that it's going to happen because I practice it, because I make it happen, because I put the time in for it. And that's then that becomes a practice for me and not a magical, mister, uh, uh, mysterious habit that I just don't have to think about. It's on autopilot. What do you, what do you, what, I'm, I'm just curious on your, your take on that. Yeah, I think you're, you're on the right track. And I want to create a slight separation in the terms. So a habit is something that's on autopilot. And habits can be good or bad. A lot of us have bad habits and are on autopilot also, right? But by definition, a habit is a b- repeated behavior that we are oftentimes unaware that we're doing. Where people, I think, get into trouble with habits is they think that the habit is some magical thing. Like, I'm just going to willpower my way to do this for 30 days or 28 days or 90 days or whatever length of time you subscribe to that you think it takes to create a habit. And that's it. Now it's stuck on me and it's going to be there forever. But the way you actually build habits is through daily practice. So I use what's, what's called the GSAP model which stands for goals, skills, practices, actions. So we're going to take whatever the bigger goal is. We're going to figure out what skills we need to develop. Then we're going to figure out what practices will actually help us to build those skills. And then, okay, what are the daily actions that help me to drive those practices? So, okay, so that that's right on my what my my kind of frame of thinking there, where habits are practices, something that I have to dedicate time to, something I have to specify and 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 practice in order to build that to become a quote unquote habit, where people think about it as as, as it runs on autopilot. Okay. Yeah, and then once it becomes a habit, then yeah, it does kind of run on autopilot, but it takes work to get there. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. So, Stephen, goals, goals. Goal setting is is of course a, a crucial part of personal development. I, I'm curious, you know, you talked about that that goal setting uh, framework that you that you mentioned there. Can you share maybe some some strategies for getting effective goals, uh, you know, that our listeners can can start to implement? Yeah, I know everyone has heard of and probably loves the idea of smart goals, and I hate it. Mm-hmm. I absolutely think smart goals are trash. Because the problem with SMART goals is they try to encompass the entire system. And they're not, that's not what they're built to do. And we're, we're told so often we have to get very specific on goals. And one of the big issues I see that happens with goals is we end up putting ourselves in a situation where we're determined to get a very specific outcome. And the reality is we don't always have full control over an outcome. So it's really about embracing the process. It's about embracing those behaviors versus trying to get a certain outcome. If I had set out to say I wanted to lose 90 pounds and I lost 80, what do you think is going to happen when I get to 80? Am I going to celebrate losing 80 pounds or am I probably going to start doing something stupid and potentially harmful to my health to get the extra 10 pounds off to say that I reached my goal? So I don't teach people to focus on outcomes. You can have an outcome as something to guide you towards, so that way you at least know if what you're doing is working. But we don't get caught up on the actual outcome itself, right? It's it's about the process and how close can we get to the outcome versus doing something that's going to make it go that way. Excuse me. Another thing that people do, and, and I'm kind of bringing this in the terms of a mistake people make, but this the tip is kind of hidden within here. The one of the big mistakes I see people make is they set what is called an avoid goal, which means I'm going to start cutting things out. And our brains are hardwired. As soon as we start telling our brain, no, you can't have that, that's bad, our brains go, I want that. 
give me more of that, right? This is why when we try to cut out sweets and things like that, we get cravings. So what I tell people is set approach goals versus saying, I'm going to cut out all the sweets. If you're not currently eating any vegetables, say, I'm going to eat one to two servings of vegetables, right? Now you're focused on what am I adding? And if you start adding more nutrition foods, you're going to automatically come out some of the bad foods because you're only going to eat so much food. If you start telling yourself that you're going to do a certain amount of movement, then that's going to be less time you're going to spend on the couch automatically. So rather than focus on what we're going to cut out, we focus on what we add. Yeah, what, a, what an interesting way to go about that because you're right. If you, you know, you're, you're thought or, or told to not do something, of course, that's the, that's the thing that you want to do. So what a, yeah, that's an that's a, uh, awesome way to, to think about that. Very good. And I like, the, I like the emphasis on the action and the habit. Like you said, you're not so much focused on the goal because oftentimes, like you said, you, you work toward it. It might not be exactly what you thought it would be. You might not reach that goal per se, but what you're focusing on is the, the habit and the action of what you're doing. And if that becomes uh, your goal is to do X, Y, or Z or B, X, Y, or Z, I think that's going to uh, be crucial in the longevity of that too. Because again, you know, you work to that goal. Even if you do reach that goal, well, if you don't set a new one, then you might get stuck or you might it might fall off. But when you're focused on doing the thing and that that becomes what you're really worried about. I think, again, that's, that's crucial for longevity and being able to sustain that because you're not so much focused on the end as much as you focused on actually doing the thing. And so that's, that's really cool to hear too. Yeah. And there's also another little point in that of it's a balance, right? We have, we do want to constantly be setting new goals, setting new things to kind of push yourself and grow. But at the same time, if you're always just on to the next thing and you don't ever stop to celebrate or appreciate how far you've come and the growth that you've had, then you can really start to find that you're not even enjoying the process. You're literally just one goal to the next, to the next, to the next. And there's never a point in your life where you sit back and you actually become happy with what you've accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's a hmm. very good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Speaking of, of smart goals, smart goals, you're right, it has, has such a, it, that is everybody's gold standard for setting goals, and it has so many downfalls uh, within. So it, it's it's nice to hear that other people are recognizing some of those downfalls and doing something about them. Yeah. Now, so we talked about some common mistakes. You know, what, what, you know, how do you, how do you help individuals determine that balance, that balance between point between setting challenging goals and helping to, you know, set goals that they can actually achieve. So what I do is I use this idea of vision. And when I talk about creating a vision, I don't mean like somebody somewhere creating a vision board where they put a Ferrari on the vision board, right? Like I'm not, that's not my, my idea. My idea is if I were to, uh, be like back to the future here, throw you in the DeLorean and take you 10, 15 years into the future. And you got to watch yourself for a day. What does future you do? What, what is their, what time do they get out of bed? What's the first thing they do? What does their routine look like? Who's around them? How are they communicating with people? You know, what are the activities that they do every day? If, if life is absolutely perfect. Now, how do we become that person? And you're not going to become that person overnight, but you can start to take on some of the traits of that person now. And so once I take people through this and they start getting a very clear vision of who it is they want to be, now we can start looking at the other frameworks. Now we can say, okay, what is it going to take? What are some of the goals that we're going to need to put in place to start getting you there? And then what are the skills we need to develop and so on and so on? And then that's when we get into practice and actions. But before we even start worrying about the, the skills and practices and actions, and we're looking at those goals, the question I always ask people is, I want you to start to think about what is that really going to take to achieve that goal? How feasible is that for you right now? Because people will always overestimate what they can handle right now. You, you tell somebody, hey, why don't you just start with a five-minute walk every day? They'll be like, I can do 45. 
and then guess how many they're going to do tomorrow? Zero, <laughs> zero minutes, right? right? Because they they accounted, they said, I'm going to do 45 and they didn't really figure out how to do it. So we help them kind of look at where they are in life right now, all the things they have going on and take a realistic look at what you can actually handle right now. And I always tell people, it is better to start too small than too big. Because if you start too small and you're like, this is a breeze, I've got this. And say a week, two weeks into the process, you've knocked out every single day. You can add a little bit to it. Whereas if you go overboard in the beginning and you miss your mark, self-doubt starts to kick in. You start to kind of beat yourself up. Especially, I, I know as men, we, we can be very hard on ourselves in, in terms of expecting perfection and expecting to perform at a high level. So when we don't, it's easier for us sometimes to scrap that goal and to go to something else. Right. And, you know, I think as you're talking about the, you know, those small things, it's those small, consistent steps that lead to big changes. It's not the, you know, it's not the 45 minute walk one time, but it's the, it's the five minute walk for 45 days that will create the momentum that will build that consistency as part of your daily practice, your daily routine. And then as you're able to consistently show up and do that, then you can increase the time. But if you do it for 45 minutes or whatever, you go all in too quick, then you don't have the opportunity to sustain that for any length of time. And then you, you, your momentum is, is stunted. And so having those small things builds the momentum. It will make a way more impactful change than that one-time output. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of things, Chris, that goes into how do we make things sustainable? And one of the things I work with my clients on is what we call the dial method. So you imagine that you have a dial that goes from zero to 10. Well, just take the zero off. It doesn't exist. We're never going to use it. So now we're between one and 10. So 10 is like everything is perfect. You can do the, the absolute maximum of whatever thing it is you're working toward. And a one is the absolute bare minimum. Like the world is falling down around you. I can still do that. And the goal is to never go below one. Go to 10 when you have to. But the reality is most days you're going to live around a six or a seven. And I think, so with that dial method, I'm, I'm sure part of the benefit to that is establishing that as a standard protocol before you go in. So what, it, what that would look like is essentially you are clearly defining what does level one look like? What does level yep. 10 look like? And then maybe five or, you know, a couple of the other levels in between so that as you show up for the day, you understand, okay, I'm at level uh, one on my energy output. So I can show up, you know, as this, in this habit as a level one, or I'm, I'm feeling awesome. I'm at, I'm at a level six on my, on my energy output level. So then I can show up as a level six, maybe it pushed to a seven on, on this specific one. But I think that unless I'm, unless I'm understanding incorrectly, but Part of it is getting a baseline understanding of what that dial looks like for each individual person so they can better apply that for themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, like if we use the example of, say, relationships, and so you think, okay, how do I want to show up for my spouse? What would a level 10 look like? Maybe, maybe level 10 is I, I go and I plan a, this huge date night and I have like all these little wonderful little surprises and I go buy the flowers and all that stuff right and I just I go over the top with the date night well maybe you know a seven is a date night but maybe not as extravagant right maybe it's more of a simple date night and maybe a one is I just dedicate at least five minutes out of the day where I can sit down no phone no tv no nothing make eye contact with my spouse and just say, hey, how is your day? How are things going? And just create that connection. So maybe, maybe that's my one. Maybe that's like, no matter what's going on in our day, we at least commit to doing that. And if you're doing something like a relationship, it's good to have your one and their one match so that at least you're on the same page with that one. But that's kind of like you set that minimum expectation every day. And then there's never a day where you didn't do something to deepen that connection. Now, as you as you go out and try to live and uh, live up to the, the the number on the dial, do you try to correspond that with the level of energy that you have for the day? So, like like I said, if I'm at a level 
seven, I try to give all my dials, all my different practices that I have up in the air at any given time, a level seven or thereabouts, so that there's a, an energy connection for those. Yeah, I mean, definitely your energy levels, but also what else is on your list that day? What other priorities do you have? Because you've got to think about not just how much energy you have, but what other things need that energy. And I guess, you know, on top of that, what other things do I, are, do I have on my list that need this energy? Where am I at? Where am I at energy level? And then what can I do to replenish my energy level? Because that's probably something that most people don't, don't think about. Yeah. And I think the other thing is people will think about, okay, so let me create all these different dials, right? So let's, let's talk about a dial for my relationship. Let's have a dial for fitness. Let's have a dial for, you know, sleep or work, all these different things. And you got to kind of think about the fact that not all those dials are going to get turned to the same level every day, right? They're not all going to be sevens. There's going to be some days where this dial is at a one. And this dial's at a 10, or maybe you do have a day that they're all at seven, right? But the thing is, it's going to fluctuate even between those things. You can't try to do every single thing at a super high level every single day. It's, that's, that's a good way to burn yourself out. Right. Yeah. All right. Now, we, we've, we've talked about setting habits and, 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 and practices and connecting those to goals. In your experience, what are some some common mindset challenges that people face when they're trying to create this positive change in their life? Yeah, one of the big things for people is we hold on to the past and we constantly use it as a measuring stick. So when somebody comes to you and gives you an idea for something and you have tried that before and it didn't work, what is your automatic response? Yeah, I tried that before. It didn't work. Now, you were at a different point in your life. You had different things going around you. You had different priorities. And maybe you had a different skill set. Maybe your skill set has grown. So you may be perfectly capable of handling that thing now, but you've convinced yourself that you can't. Or you try to put too much on it before. You try to do too much at once instead of taking those small steps like we talked about. And so maybe you just needed a better approach to it. So rather than just thinking, okay, yes, I do understand that's what I need to do. Let's figure out how to make it work. It's easy for people to get caught up in, well, I've tried that and it didn't work. And then what happens is even if you do try it, if you have that mentality, as soon as it gets hard, now that reinforcement comes in of, yeah, see, I knew I wasn't going to be able to stick with this. Okay. In those instances, because I'm, I'm sure that happens all the time, because we all we all have these stories that we're told when we're young, or by our, our you know our trusted people that are around us that says, "Hey, you can't do this. This isn't going to work." You know all these things, and we start to believe these stories. What what are some some ways that I can move away from those mindsets and leave those stories in the past? Yeah, I think one of the big things is you have to start looking at your wins and your strengths. So maybe things didn't turn out exactly the way you wanted, but what did actually work? Where was even the smallest of wins at? <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I start off every single client session with the same question. What were our wins for the week? Doesn't matter how small they are. You're not allowed to start by telling me what went wrong. <laughs> you have to tell me what went well. Because we want to get focused on those things because the things that went well, where you had success, indicates there was a strength that helped you get there. And then if we can figure out what the strength was that helped you get there, then we can figure out how to make that thing implemented into something else. So it, just to make this a simple example here, let's say somebody goes and, and they're working on you know, diet and nutrition or sorry, diet and exercise. And so they come to me and they go, well, you know, I did work out three days this week. But then, you know, they, they, they blurred out, but I didn't, I didn't meal prep. I didn't figure out any of my meals for the week. So I ended up not doing great there. Well, rather than focus on the, you didn't eat well this week, which is what a lot of coaches unfortunately would do. I'm going to say, cool. So you worked out, you know, your three days this week. What do you think allowed you to do that? You know, what was it that helped you do that? And they go, well, you know, I planned for this and I did this. Okay, cool. So what you're telling me is 
you have some good organizational skills and some good time management skills that allowed you to get those workouts in. Well, yeah. Okay, well, how do we take those and use those to help you do the same thing with your nutrition that you did with your exercise this week? Boom, light bulb. And so the cool thing about that is you, if you always start your, your sessions like that, then they show up to one or two or three sessions. At some point, they're going to, uh, you know, a, a flip a, they're going to flip a switch and start to realize, oh, okay, every time I show up, he's going to ask me this. And what that does for them is that will reframe the situation so they're on the lookout for positive things so that when they yep. meet with you, they can say, hey, these are the my wins for the week. And that puts them in a positive mindset. And of course, if you're looking for positive things, you're going to find positive things. And that will further that positivity in wins and successes because that's the things that you're asking them to look for. And then, of course, as you are conversing with them, you're not dwelling on the things that they didn't do so well. You're talking up the things that they did well, and you're trying to apply those to the other areas that they didn't so they can see that as, oh, hey, I did good in this. I bet if I if I put some time and effort in, I bet I can, over, I can overflow that into this area, and that would help. Oh, man, that'd be so much better. And then, of course, yep. they'll do that. And then the <clears> next <throat> week, they come to you and say, oh, man, hey, look, I did this, and I did this, and this, and that win for that week is so much even better. And then you just further that that connection. Yeah. Remember when we started and I said the same things that allowed me to lose 80 pounds, allowed me to start a successful business and podcast and all that good stuff. That's exactly what we're talking about, because I was able to look at the skills that I already possessed, the, the natural talents or even the skills that I developed that helped me to lose 80 pounds. Things like time management, things like organization, things like my, uh, my ability just to kind of deal with adversity, right? All of those things I could uh, then apply. So maybe if I hit, you know, a rough patch in my marriage at some point, I can think back to that time where I was stuck on a weight loss plateau for like two months and how I was able to kind of figure out how to get through that. It's like, okay, I've in the past had a similar situation where I struggled with something where I was frustrated. And I was able to reflect in that moment on like, how was I feeling? What was going on? What was causing that? And look and go, okay, are some of those same things, same things coming up for me now in this situation? Am I making some of the same mistakes I made in the past? Oh, wait, yes, I am. I've gone back to some old habits maybe that I forgot about. And now I know how to fix those because I fixed them before. It was a different context, but it was, it's still the same thing. I'm still dealing with the same issue and I know how to fix that. Now. I'm curious if you have coaching, not everybody can, can have a coach, and which is, which is unfortunate because I think there's a, a, some key benefits that, to being coached by somebody. What are yeah. some practices that somebody could implement that would help to facilitate that positivity cycle that somebody could apply on their own in their own life without necessarily having a coach? Yeah, I think the biggest and easiest things that anybody can do is Every single day when you get up, start a gratitude journal. And it's going to seem silly, right? You're, at first, you, you might have some things that are like really big. And then you're going to start getting to the point where you're, like, you're writing down silly stuff, or at least what's going to feel like silly stuff. But what I want to encourage people to do is even when you get to the point where you feel like the things you're writing down that you think are silly, like ask yourself, why are you actually thankful for that thing? Like, what is it about that thing that gives you gratitude? Because once you start to understand why you're thankful for things, not just, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to just say I'm thankful for something, but actually understanding why you're thankful for it, it actually creates a deeper appreciation for it. And you start to realize that the bad things that happen in your day are not the only things that happen to you. We tend to put a lot of emphasis when something bad happens. I've literally had a client. They would start off by telling me how their day started so bad because something happened with their car and they were late to work and, you know, just all this other stuff. And as we're talking, I found out there were like four or five really good things that happened to them that day at work. But they were only focused on the fact that their car had problems and they were late instead of focusing on the positives. So every day, just start thinking about that, what you're actually thankful for and why you're thankful for it. Like really kind of push yourself to go that extra level deep. And then every single day, 
at the end of the day, write down what your wins for the day were. And then think about what did you do from a behavior standpoint that either caused or helped to facilitate that win? Yeah. Journaling is, is, is so impactful, so impactful. And, and for myself, I do a, I do a morning and, and evening, and maybe it would be more of a log as opposed to a journal. But in the morning, I put the time I woke up, I put my, my intention for the day and the thing I'm looking forward to. What am I most looking forward for the day? And then at the end, I, of course, I do my, my gratitude and I strive to put three things in, although sometimes it's like two or maybe even one on some bad days, but I, I put my gratitude in. I put the wins in, I put the losses in, and I put the takeaways from the losses. Like what, okay, this is the bad thing that happened. What's the takeaway from this? How can I avoid this from happening so I can learn from that? And then the last one is I, I put the thing that I learned for the day. And what I found is putting, you know, my favorite part of the day, my, my, my thing, what the thing I'm thankful for, that will shift my focus throughout the day so that I, because I know that at the end of the day, I'm going to have to write these things down. As I'm going through my day, I'm looking for my what my favorite part of the day is going to be. I'm looking for things that I can be thankful for so I can write down, I'm looking for the wins that I can. And if I have something that happens that is that's not so helpful, that's a loss or a negative that happens, okay, here's the challenge. No. Let me think about this. How can I, how can I, what's the takeaway from this? What, how can I, what, what did I learn from this? And being able to think about those because I know I'm committed to making that journal down every day. It reframes all of that for me. It sets me in, in such a, a different light than it was before I was doing that. It's it's so impactful and so easy to do. It's so easy to do. It would be, um, it's amazing. Yes, agreed. So uh, I'm actually going to share one of my very favorite tools that I use in my coaching be, because it ties into something you just mentioned. You, you talked about how when you have something that didn't go well and, and you kind of ask yourself, like, why didn't it go well? And what could I have done differently? So one of the tools I use with my clients is when we're looking at things that didn't go according to plan, I, I have a separate form that I give them for this. And it has three columns. What's 100% within your control? What's somewhat within your control? And what's completely outside of your control? And so when you have something bad happen, you have to take that thing and sit down and say, okay, when I think of all the things that caused this, which ones were 100% of my control, which ones were somewhat in my control, and which ones did I not have any control over at all? And anything that falls in that last category, we just don't worry about it. We just say, you know what? Things happen. It is what it is. If I have some control, okay, what aspect of it can I control? And then obviously the parts that you have complete control over how do you want to move forward with that? And, and by breaking into those three categories, it allows you to stop focusing on the parts that you can't do anything about. Yeah, what what an interesting way to do that. And and as you, as I'm listening to you to you talk about those, one thing that is either one thing that is definitively fully in my control or the, whoever it is is the way you respond to in that situation. And I yeah. think that that probably it's not always. It's not always what happens to you. It's how you respond to what happens to you that that really tells people who and how you are. So, you know, despite whatever negative thing is, if I can take it in stride, if I have resilience, if I can, if I can adapt or mold or pivot or whatever the, the key term is, and I can come out of it with a positive, that's the thing that I can control is how yeah. I let that thing affect me, how I respond in those situations. And so what a what an awesome way to share that type of, of mindset, you know, so what's fully in my control, what's somewhat in my control, what's not at all in my control. And then what that does is that allows them to set that up specifically in their head. Like, okay, I couldn't have thought this was going to happen. I couldn't have expected this was going to happen. So I can't, I don't need to worry about those things. These are some no. things that I could, yeah, what a, yeah, what an excellent tool for that. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I mean, and think about it, from this way. So just as an easy example here, a lot of times one of the things that people want to control is the way other people act. Mm -hmm. And we can't control that, right? We can't force other people to do what we want them to do. Now we can think about how do I communicate? What steps do I take? What things do I do that may influence that person to behave in a way that I want them to? But at the end of the day, you have to accept 
if you're going to do those things and you're doing them specifically to try to manipulate that person, you're probably going to end up frustrated. But if you're doing them because that's the person you want to be, right, going back to that vision, if that's the person you want to be and that's the way you want to communicate with people, then you're okay with the outcome and you understand that you can't control the outcome. Wow. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think that, I think that creating lasting behavior change, it it can be daunting. Um, Can you, can you share some practical advice on how our listeners can make sustainable behavior changes? I think the easiest way I can really show this to people visually is by explaining my process that I used to lose 80 pounds. I never actually set a number in my head. In other words, I broke every single rule of of smart goals, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I never set out to say, I'm going to lose 80 pounds. I was actually quite delusional. I thought I had like 40 pounds to lose. <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up losing twice that. And I'm like, okay, clearly I had more than 40 pounds. And if I had set a goal of 40 pounds, I probably would have been like, okay, why am I still so overweight? Because I had only lost half the weight I need to lose. But what I did do was I said, you know what? Let me focus on what I can do on my next meal. Let me focus on what I can do on my next workout. And I never worried about really past that. Now, it is beneficial to have a long-term plan for some of this stuff, right? Like, so exercise, for example, if you have a program that builds upon itself that, you know, constantly helps you get better, stronger, and all those things, that's ideal. But when you're starting out, it's not necessary because you are at a stage early on where you're going to experience growth regardless. So you can really just start by doing things. And then as it becomes more of a habit, you can add more complexity to it. So when it comes to nutrition, and this is where I'll kind of give the example with my weight loss, I never said, oh, I'm going to go eat, you know, nothing but like salads and this, that, and the other, and I'm going to eat this many grams of protein and carbs and fat. I didn't do all that stuff in the beginning. In the beginning, I was still working in the mall. I was working as a retail store manager. And I was having to go to the food court to eat. And I just started with, you know what? Today, instead of getting a double cheeseburger, I think I'm just going to get a single. I think instead of getting an extra large fry, I think I'm just going to maybe get a large fry. And then eventually that turned into a medium fry. And then eventually that turned into, well, maybe I'll order like a baked potato or I'll get some rice or something. And so it was these small little changes over time and they were individual decisions they weren't some long term like two months from now i'm going to be eating grilled chicken like it was like i didn't i didn't plan it that way it was like literally i'm standing there going you know what maybe maybe i'll try the grilled chicken today right okay yeah that that didn't really taste that great well what if i try this condiment on my grilled chicken or what if i try this condiment on the grilled chicken i would try different things to see what you know if i could make myself like it and then you start to find little things that work. There was one day, and, and I always share the story because it's kind of funny that people think everything has to be so intentional, so well laid out. And sometimes laziness can work. I, I ordered a baked potato and I forgot to ask for butter and sour cream. And so they had none. And I was just honestly, it was a long day. It was really rough. I didn't feel like getting back up and going and ask for it. So I just decided to eat my baked potato with nothing on it except for some black pepper. And you know what? I found out that I'm actually okay eating baked potatoes without butter and sour cream on them. Think how many calories I saved going forward just by not having butter and sour cream on my potato. Now, sometimes I'm like, hey, I want some butter and sour cream today. I use it. But I'm also okay not using it. And I'm not suggesting that everyone out there needs to cut out butter and sour cream. But I'm just saying you don't know sometimes what you're okay with. Until you try, because we tell ourselves those stories of, no, that's, that's not going to taste good. That's not going to be something I want to do. And if you haven't tried it, you don't really know. Yeah. And, and what, a, what a, uh, an interesting way to establish that you're okay without those things, with, without trying them. You have to experiment, say, what, what can I live without? 
and let's try this. Okay, yep, okay, let's try this. And you have to, you almost have to go past the point that you're comfortable with and say, okay, yep, that was too far. I got to have, you know, the salt or pepper or whatever it is that, that's, that's on it and figure out where that line is for you so you can know what to go up to but not cross. Yeah, and, and the thing is, you don't have to go all in on it either, right? Like, say somebody just wanted to kind of do this as an experiment. You could literally get your potato, just ask to not have the butter and sour cream actually on the potato. Just ask for it on the side. And then you could literally just take a bite. See if you like it. If you're like, no, nah, that's not really for me. Maybe you start with a little tiny amount of butter. How does that taste? Do I, do I need to drown my potato in butter or am I okay using maybe like a, a quarter of the butter I normally use, right? And you start to all of a sudden realize like, oh, okay. Like me, I love ice cream. I, if you put a gallon of ice cream in front of me, I will eat the entire thing in one sitting and won't even have guilt about it. But I know that's not really healthy for me. So what I do is I go buy these little teeny, I don't know if you've ever seen them or not, but they're like super tiny little serving size. It's like, it's, not, it's probably barely enough ice cream for a child, but what it does is it gives me the taste. And what I realized a lot of times is I didn't really need a lot of ice cream. I just wanted the taste of it. And so I just eat this little teeny tiny cup of ice cream and I'm good. It takes care of the gravy. And what we're talking about here is, um, you know, creating these small things step by step, little by little. Oh, and over mm -hmm. time, because you're doing the work on the, the smaller level, that's helping to build up these habits and build up these, these wins that you can draw your strength from. And I think that mm -hmm. is the key to uh, long lasting change. But the problem is everyone wants that quick fix. Everyone wants that quick turnaround and say, hey, I want to do something in 30 days and I want to lose 80 pounds in 30 days doing this thing or whatever. And not that you can't do that. There are ways that you can go through doing that. I just don't think that they are um, necessarily always long lasting or in most cases, not exactly good for you or healthy for you. And so yep. when we're talking about this, you know, understanding that there is a lot of work to go into it and it can take a lot of time and it's not going to be a linear thing where you start at point A and then all of a sudden you're at point B. You might get to point A and get part of the way to point B and then go back to where you and, But when you do it this way and you make the small changes and you really commit to uh, investing into those strengths, it does help with that long term because you have such a strong foundation rather than the quick yeah. turnaround of, oh, you know, I did this quick fix and well, if I stop this thing for one day, then I lose all of my progress. We're, again, doing it little by little, step by step, creating these habits and these this, this strong foundation is key to making it a long lasting thing. But again, people don't yeah. like that because it's not instant gratification. They have to put some work into it and stick to it. But that is the 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 way to make it last longer. I'm so glad you brought this up because... I think one of the biggest misconceptions that we have today is that everyone's looking for a quick fix. And no one is looking for a quick fix. People, and, and somebody out there right now is going, what do you mean? I definitely want a quick fix. Here's what people really want. They want to get rid of the pain. Right? If I feel, if I'm overweight as an example, and I feel that my weight is holding me back from being a good father, being able to play with my kids, if I feel like it's holding me back from getting a, a promotion at work because I feel like people are judging me based on my appearance, if I feel like it's making my love life not be as good as it could be because maybe I feel like my spouse doesn't find me attractive, if those things are happening and I think that the weight is the root cause, of course, I want the weight gone as fast as possible because I think it's the problem. The weight's not the problem, though. The problem is the behaviors that are keeping you overweight. So once we shift the perspective and go, hey, listen, I know you want to get rid of the weight as fast as possible because you think that's going to solve all the problems. But here is the reality of the situation. You don't have to wait until you've lost all of the weight to start doing these things. There are some things you can do today. There are some things that you're going to be able to do when you're 10 pounds lighter. There's some things that you're going to be able to do when you're 20 pounds lighter. There's other things that you're going to be able to do when you get to 50 pounds lighter, right? So it's, it's a progression of what you're going to be able to do. 
what most people's thought process is, I cannot do any of these things until I have six pack abs. And that's just not true. Yeah, I like the perspective. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. As we're talking, is there, so you've, you've met with a lot of clients. You've done this for a length of time. Is there a overarching habit, an overarching practice, an overarching substance that, that can be applied to most everybody, regardless of where they are, if they're, if what their, what their main goal is that would improve their ability and, and improve their, their life on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis? <clears throat> I would say if there's one single practice, we already kind of mentioned, you know, things like the gratitude and and all that kind of stuff. And and this kind of plays a part in that. But if there's one single practice or habit that I would encourage every single person to develop, it's to create time for yourself every single day to just sit in silence. And it, it might just be a couple of minutes. It might be an hour. It doesn't really matter. You don't need to do any like special breathing exercises or sit in a special stance or anything else. It's literally just a time for you to shut things down and be able to hear your own thoughts. Right. And, and if you're, and if you're someone of faith, maybe that's, you know, time that you spend in prayer. But to me, when you take the opportunity to kind of quiet things down, you get clarity. I mean, how many times have you ever had something on your mind and it's just like stressing you out and you can't figure out a solution for it and you go to bed and you get a good night's sleep and all of a sudden you wake up the next morning and an answer is there? Well, that's because when you were asleep, you actually were able to shut your brain off, shut all the outside noise off and be able to actually figure out what's going on. Most of us pretty much know what we should be doing most of the time. And I always tell people, like, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to help guide you to figure out what you already know and, and help you implement it. That, that's my job as a coach. My job is not to just give you instructions. I, I view working with every client as two experts working together. I'm an expert on things like sleep and nutrition and fitness and habits and communication and all that stuff. You're an expert on you. And... I just would encourage people to take that time every day to hear from your own expert. Yeah. What a, what a good way to do that. And you, you know, I think having that time set aside to sit quietly with your own thoughts is something that society as a whole is, is, is really missing out on because we're so on the instant gratification of the phone or we have this or that, you know, we're pulled in all these different directions being able to take a few moments to sit and, and with your own thoughts and, and to not have any distractions to kind of reset or recalibrate whatever it is that you're going through, take a deep breath and then go about whatever it is, you know, that, that, that has to happen next is, is a profound and, and incredibly beneficial practice that anybody can incorporate and would be immediately helpful to where they are. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's also a good way to kind of, regulate your stress responses because you're teaching yourself how to actually relax. And that's something that most of us, and especially in today's day and age, don't do. Like, I've literally had clients go and tell me, well, I don't even think I can take 30 seconds to do a breathing exercise. You can, I promise. (laughs) You can find 30 seconds to do a breathing exercise just to kind of calm yourself down a little bit. Yeah. So as we're talking about this, I, I, I'm trying to think about, do I do this sometime in my day? And, and maybe this is a, a cheating way to do it. But as I'm mm-hmm. driving in my car, I don't have any radio on. And most of the time, it's just me in my car. Yeah. That is my time to recalibrate. And, and maybe I'm cheating a little bit because I'm driving. and My brain is still actively kind of doing things. But if I'm sitting at a light or whatever, it's just silent. It's just me in my car. And so that's my way to kind of recalibrate that. And then course where whenever i get to where i'm going i have a few seconds that i can choose to take if i wish before i go into you know that meeting or 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 to work or into the house for 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 the night or whatever i have that time to to sit still with myself Mm -hmm. in the silence because there's no sound there's no nothing going on before i go and, and do my next thing and i i actually use that to help to set the intention of what it is that i'm doing next so if i want to you know go and see my family i try to 
close the the doors to work and my mind sort of say, and then I'm in family mode. And so I set the intention of being in family mode or if I'm at work and or vice versa, try to specifically set that intention to where I'm going and how I want that, uh, how I want to be present in those moments. Yeah. And, and I will just add that silence doesn't necessarily have to mean silence. Silence is just saying that you're not at, actively doing something right like you're not trying to force the issue you're you're really just kind of allowing thoughts to kind of come in and out maybe maybe you're just having a conversation with yourself right if if you're a solopreneur like me you call those team meetings it makes it sound less crazy um so you know you have team meetings with yourself uh me myself and i it's all three of you accountable and you can really just kind of have those conversations maybe they're in your head maybe they're out loud Maybe it's just you you have a thought that comes to mind and you kind of notice it and you go, huh, that's interesting. And then you think about it and you just kind of allow the thoughts to come in. So it doesn't necessarily even have to be a quiet time. It's just about not having other things distract you. Extra, and you try to cut out the extra stimulus. Okay, very good. Now, yep. as we're talking about this, this kind of leads into setting up your environment for mm -hmm. success. And yep. Can, can you share some examples of how altering one's physical or even digital environment can lead to improved productivity or even well-being? Yeah, there, there's so many things that you can actually do, right? Uh, so one of the things I have my really, really busy clients who want to start improving their physical health, but they just don't really have time for full workout, is we do trigger workouts, which means you're just doing a very small amount of exercise multiple times throughout the day. And so it can be something as simple as you've got a kettlebell sitting next to your desk and every time you look at it, you have to pick it up and do something with it, right? Or maybe it's having your workout shoes be right by the front door so that you have to see them, right? And so there's all these little physical things like that that you can do as reminders to yourself. I'll also share that your physical environment can also help shape habits in a very interesting way. One thing I see with a lot of times with people is they do things on routine. Because remember, like we said, habits, by definition, are repeated behaviors that we oftentimes are not aware of. And so one of the easiest ways to break a habit is by actually changing something in the routine. Perfect example of this. I had a client that no matter what they did, they could not stop snacking late at night. Just every single night, no matter what they tried to do, even though they were knocking out all these other things, just could not stop themselves wanting to go get a late night snack before bed. And so one day I said, okay, let's try something. Tonight, when you find yourself walking down the stairs, I want you to become aware of it. I want you to say, I want you to start talking out loud and say, I'm going downstairs to get a snack. And I want you to pay attention to the path that you're walking and everything else. And so they did. And so I said, okay, next day, what I want you to do is I want you to go the opposite way around your kitchen island. So every, every night, you know, as they're, as they're walking through this, like, you know, I go to the left and I did it. I go, so we're going to go to the right. Just that simple change of going to the right made them go, wait a minute, why am I getting the snack? Because their brain had to come off of autopilot when they took a right. So that, that's a inserting pattern interrupts into their daily routine so they can re help to recognize that there's a pattern that they're following and that's leading to a negative habit. And how can I, what's the smallest thing I can do to interrupt that pattern so that it doesn't lead to that negative habit that I don't want to have happen? Yeah. So like in this instance, let's say that this client just couldn't get themselves to be aware that they were doing. They just kept finding themselves going to the left no matter what, even after we talked about it. Then I probably would have said, okay, let's do this. Tonight, put a chair in the way. Well, now, even if you just walk into the chair, that's a pattern interrupt, right? So instantaneously now, it's like you have no choice. So the little things like that you can do to manipulate your environment, they will actually help you to be more consistent with things. Um, like one of my things I do is I'm right now going through um, this Bible in a year thing. 
And what I know is I have a pattern of when I come and sit down at my desk, I'm going to turn on my computer. I'm going to start looking at email. I'm going to start doing those things. That's just, I know that that's my pattern. So rather than have it, you can actually probably see it over my shoulder, right underneath the lamp. You can see the book laying there. Mm -hmm. That's where my book goes every night. I put it there because when I get up in the morning, my new pattern is I walk over to that desk and I pick up the book. So by picking up the book first, I've now broken my pattern. So even if I bring the book to my desk, I'm not tempted to turn my computer screen on until I've done my reading. All right. As we're, as we're talking about this, mm -hmm. is there a point that that specific pattern interrupt stops working? Because my brain would, would all right, so I'm going down the stairs. I put a chair in the way. All right, that works for five days or something. Then I just start moving that chair to go back to, to the habit that, that, I'm, that I have because my new, my new pattern is that I go back, I stop at the chair, but I still want that snack. So I'm going to move that chair out of the way and I go to it. Is there, is there a point that that, like there, is there like a next step to this or another uh, addition to this? Or is that just like that works and that works? No, I think there, there's two reasons why it can stop working. Uh, one is we do tend to, after a while, start to recognize a new pattern in our brains. And it just kind of becomes like a stuck pattern. But at the same time, we start to block it out. So a lot of times people use visual reminders like a post-it note. If you ever put a post-it note up somewhere in the first day or two, you look at it. And by day three, that thing is basically invisible, even though it's right in front of your face. That's exactly what we're talking about here. You become blind to it and it stops happening. So visual reminders like that are actually very easy for our brains to override. They usually only last a couple of days at most. And so when I have my clients do the trigger workouts, one of the things I have them do is I have them place the kettlebell in a different place every couple of days just to constantly keep their brain guessing as to where that thing is going to be. But the other thing that might happen is that sometimes it might not just have been a pattern, right? Maybe the pattern was the cause. If we do a pattern interrupt and you never go back to it, it was just the pattern. But maybe there's a deeper reason why you're getting that late night snack. And so in that instance, the chair might help for a couple of days, but then you're going to go back to it. And at that point, now we need to go back and reevaluate, okay, why are we really getting the snack now? Because the pattern may have been a part of the problem, but it clearly wasn't the whole problem. Yes. You know, hey, Steve, I want to tell you, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your insights, your goal setting, mindset, behavior change, and, and you know, creating success oriented uh, environment. And, you know, before we, before we wrap up, do you have any, any final thoughts or key takeaways that you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah. I, one thing that I, I do with my coaching programs, and I think this is a, such a huge thing for everybody to do, is not just pick habits to work on, but establish them into routines. And, and I like to have three routines. I like to have a morning routine. I like to have an afternoon routine. And I like to have an evening routine. Now, everyone's schedule is going to be a little different. I'm not one of those, you have to do all your stuff first thing in the morning, people, because I'm a night owl. I've, I'm not a morning person. So... I don't buy into that because my brain doesn't necessarily function the greatest first thing in the morning. So for me, my midday routine is when most of my stuff happens. But just to kind of, you know, give an example here, maybe your morning routine is like two hours long. And maybe that's a time where you get your workouts in, you, you know, you spend your time in your silence or prayer, you read a book and, you know, maybe you, you know, get 30, 45 minutes worth of work done. And, and that's your morning routine. And then maybe your afternoon routine is, you know, I'm just going to go for a walk on my lunch break, like a 15 minute walk on my lunch break. And then your evening routine is what are you doing to get yourself prepared for success the next day? Uh, so things like your gratitude journal, writing down your wins, writing down your three big tasks for the next day and, and maybe creating a bedtime routine. And, and so that might be between 30 minutes to an hour long for your nighttime routine. So if you create those three routines and you figure out how do you want to place your habits throughout the day within those three routines, it's going to give you so much clarity on how to spend your days. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and you know, if, if our listeners wanted to learn more about you, where could they go to do that? Yeah, the best place to go is my website, unshakablehabits.com. That has links to all my social media, my podcast, 
uh, they can book a free roadmap call with me there. So uh, that's going to be the best place to go. Unshakeablehabits.com. Very good. I'll, I'll be sure to link those, uh, link that in the show notes as well. Listeners, remember, it's not just about setting goals. It's about cultivating the habits, the mindsets that will help you achieve them. If you found today's episode valuable, uh, please consider reviewing it or sharing it with your friends or colleagues. Make every day count, and we'll catch you in the next episode.